Section 10 of the Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 21 Return to the Coast of Coral Mandel. Arrival at the Palace of Giath Adin. Short account of the governors of those parts. War with the Hindus. The Hindu king taken and slain. Fatan. Different animals kept in the same cage. Matare. Giath Adin dies, succeeded by his brother's son, Nasir Adin. Fatan. Kalam. Hinaur. Taken prisoner by the Hindus. Calicut, arrival at the Maldive Islands, Bengal, Sad Kewon, Mountains of Kumru, the Sheikh Tabrizi, miracles ascribed to him, Jabnak, Blue River, Setkar Kewon, Baraknakur, Produce, Character of the People, Customs, after this we sailed with the vessel which had waited for us to the Ma'abur districts. But when we had made half the voyage the wind rose upon us and we were near drowning. We then cut down our mast and every moment expected death. Providence, however, was favorable to us, for there came boats from the infidel inhabitants of the Ma'abur, which brought us to land. I then told them that I was the messenger of their king, and that he was my relation upon which they landed us and treated us very honorably. They wrote to the king on this, as I also did, telling him what had happened. After three days came an emir from the sultan with a number of cavalry. For me they brought a palanquin and ten horses to carry me. We then set out for the presence of the king, Giyath Adin el Damgani, who at this time enjoyed the supreme power in the Ma'abur districts. These parts formerly belonged to the emperor of Hindustan, the Sultan Muhammad. They were then seized by the Sharif, Jalal Adin Hassan Shah, who held them for five years. After this he appointed Alay Adin, one of his emirs, as his successor. But he was killed in a warlike excursion by an accidental arrow. After this his brother's son, Khatbi Adin, came to the supreme rule but he was killed in consequence of his bad conduct. After this, one of the emirs of the Sharif, Jalal Adin, came into power. That is, this Giyath Adin, who married a daughter of Jalal Adin, the mother of which daughter was sister to my wife when I was judge in Delhi. When I had got near his house, he sent one of his chamberlains to meet me, and when I entered, he received me graciously and gave me a seat. He was at this time in his camp, so he erected three tents for me opposite those of his judge, Sadar al-Zaman. He also sent me a carpet, provisions, and presents. This was a very warlike prince, and as he happened to be in the neighborhood of an infidel whose army amounted to one hundred and twenty thousand men, an attempt was made to take these Ma'abur districts out of the hands of the Mohammedans. This infidel prince accordingly made an attack on the count of Kion, which belongs to the Ma'abur, and in which there were six thousand soldiers, put them to the rout and besieged it. This was reported to the Sultan, and that the town was nearly lost. He then marched out with his forces, which amounted to seven thousand, every man of whom took off his turban, and hung it upon the neck of his horse, which is in India an intimation that they are bent upon death. They then made a charge upon the infidel king while his men were taking their midday repose and besieging Kion, and put them to the rout. The greater part of them was killed, nor did one except the cavalry or those who concealed themselves in the woods escape. The sultan was taken prisoner, his wealth seized, himself afterwards killed, and I saw his body hanging against a wall in the town. I then left the king's station until he should return from his expedition, and came to the city of Fatan, which is large and beautiful, and situated upon the seashore. Its harbor is truly wonderful. In this city there are grapes and good pomegranates. I saw in this place the Sheikh Salih Muhammad of Nisabur, 
one of the fanatical fakirs who suffer their hair to flow down loosely upon their shoulders. This man had seven foxes with him, all of which ate and sat with the fakirs. There were also with him thirty other fakirs, one of whom had a gazelle with a lion in the same place, which was unmolested by the lion. I then proceeded for the purpose of presenting myself to the sultan at the city of Mature, which is large and not unlike Delhi. In this I found a great mortality which had destroyed the greatest part of the inhabitants. The king, Giyath Adin, returned at this time to his palace sick, and soon after died. He appointed his brother's son, Nasir Adin, to be his successor. In this place, too, I caught a fever which nearly destroyed me. But as Providence restored me to health, I requested permission of the king, Nasir Adin, to proceed on my journey, which was granted. I then returned to the city of Fatan, Patan, and thence by sea to Kalam one of the cities of Malabar, where I remained three months on account of the sickness which had happened to me. From this place I set out to visit the Sultan Jamal ad of Hinaur, who had received a promise from me to return. The infidel Hindus, however, came out against us in twelve war vessels between the last place mentioned and Fekanun, and giving us severe battle at length overcame us and took our ship. They then stripped us of all. From me they took all the jewels and rubies given me by the king of Batela, as well as the additional presence of the pious sheiks, leaving me only one pair of trousers, and thus were we landed nearly naked. I then returned to Calicut and entered one of the mosques. When some of the lawyers and merchants who had known me in Delhi heard of my situation, they clothed and received me honorably. I then thought of returning to the emperor of Hindustan, but I was afraid of his severity, and that he might ask me why I had separated from the present. I then went on board another ship, and this pleased me and returned to the Maldive Islands on account of the little boy I had left there. When I had seen him, however, I left him in kindness to his mother. The vizier then furnished me with provisions, and I sailed for Bengal, which is an extensive and plentiful country. I never saw a country in which provisions were so cheap. I there saw one of the religious of the West, who told me that he had bought provisions for himself and his family for a whole year, with eight dirhams. The first town I entered here was Sidkewan, which is large and situated on the seashore. The king of Bengal at this time was Fakir Adin. He was an eminent man, kind to strangers and persons of the Sufi persuasion. But I did not present myself to him, nor did I see him, because he was opposed to the emperor, and was then in open rebellion against him. From Sidkewan I travelled for the mountains of Kemru, which are at the distance of one month from this place. These are extensive mountains, and they join the mountains of Tibet, where there are musk gazelles. The inhabitants of these mountains are, like the Turks, famous for their attention to magic. My object in visiting these mountains was to meet one of the saints, namely the Sheikh Jalal Adin of Tabriz. This Sheikh was one of the greatest saints, and one of those singular individuals who had the power of working great and notable miracles. He had also lived to a remarkably great age. He told me that he had seen El Mosta Asim, the Caliph in Baghdad, and his companions told me afterwards that he died at the age of one hundred and fifty years that he fasted through a space of about forty years, never breaking his fast till he had fasted throughout ten successive days. He had a cow on the milk of which he usually breakfasted, and his practice was to sit up all night. It was by his means that the people of these mountains became Mohammedans, and on this account it was that he resided among them. One of his companions told me that on the day before his death he invited them all to come to him. He then said to them, Tomorrow I depart from you, Deo Valente, and my vice-regent with you is God, besides whom, there is, besides whom there is no other God. When the evening of the following day had arrived, and he had performed the last prostration of the evening prayer, he was taken by God. On the side of the cave in which he had resided was found a grave ready dug, and by it a winding sheet and burial spices. The people then washed and buried him in them, and said their prayers over him. When I was on my journey to see this sheik, four of his companions met me at the distance of two days, and told me that the sheik had said to the fakirs who were with them, A western religious traveller is coming to you. Go out and meet him. 
It was, said they, by the order of the sheik that we came to you, notwithstanding the fact that he had no knowledge whatever of my circumstances except what he had by divine revelation. I went with them accordingly to his cell without the cave, near which there was no building whatever. The people of this country are partly Mohammedans and partly infidels, both of whom visit the sheik and bring valuable presents. On these the fakirs and other persons who arrive here subsist. As for the sheik himself, he confines himself to the milk of his cow, as already mentioned. When I presented myself to him, he arose and embraced me. He then asked me of my country and travels of which I informed him. He then said to the fakirs, Treat him honorably. They accordingly carried me to the cell and kept me as their guest for three days. On the day I presented myself to the sheik, he had on a religious garment made of fine goat's hair. I was astonished at it and said to myself, I wish the sheik would give it to me. When I went in to bid him farewell, he arose and went to the side of the cave, took off the goat's hair garment as well as the fillet of his head and his sleeves, and put them on me. The fakirs then told me that it was not his practice to put on this garment, and that he had put it on only on the occasion of my coming, for he had said to them, This garment will be wished for by a Maghrabin, but an king shall take it from him, and shall give it to our brother Boranadin of Segirs, whose it is, and for whose use it has been made. When I was told this by the fakirs, I said, As I have a blessing from the sheik, and as he has clothed me with his own clothes, I will never enter with them into the presence of any king, either infidel or Moslem. After this I left the sheik. It happened, however, after a considerable time, that I entered the country of China, and went as far as the city of Kanze. Upon a certain occasion, when my companions had all left me on account of the press of the multitude, and I had this garment on, and was on the road, I met the vizier with a large body. He happened to cast his eyes upon me, and called me to him. He then took me by the hand, and asked me why I had come to this country, nor did he leave me until we came to the king's palace. I wished to go, but he would not allow me to do so, but took me into the king, who interrogated me about the Mohammedan sovereigns, to all which I gave answers. He then cast his eyes upon the garment, and began to praise it, and said to the vizier, Take it off him. To this I could offer no resistance, so he took it, but ordered me ten dresses of honor, and a horse with its furniture, and money for my necessities. This changed my mind. I then called to mind the words of the sheik that an infidel king should take it, and my wonder was increased. After a year had elapsed, I entered the palace of the king of China at Kanbalik. My object was to visit the cell of the sheik Borhan Adin of Sagirj. I did so and found him reading, and the very goat's hair garment I have been mentioning was on him. I was surprised at this, and was turning the garment over in my hand when he said, Why do you turn the garment over? Do you know it? I said, I do. It is the garment which the king of Kanze took from me. He answered, This garment was made for me by my brother, Jalal ad for my own use, who also wrote to me to say that the garment would come to me by such a person. He then produced the letter which I read, and could not help wondering at the exactness of the sheik. I then told him of the origin of the story. He answered, My brother Jalal ad was superior to all this. He had a perfect control over human nature, but now he has been taken to God's mercy. He then said, I have been told, that he performed the morning prayer every day in Mecca, that he went on the pilgrimage annually, because he was never to be seen on the two days of Arafat and the feast, no one knowing whither he had gone. When, however, I had bid farewell to the Sheikh Jalal ad -Din, I travelled to the city of Jabnak, which is very large and beautiful. It is divided by the river which descends from the mountains of Kamru, called the Blue River. By this one may travel to Bengal and the countries of Laknuti. Upon it are gardens, mills, and villages which it refreshes and gladdens like the Nile of Egypt. The inhabitants of these parts are infidels tributary to the Mohammedans. By this river I travelled for fifteen days, proceeding from road to road till I came to the city of Sutirkewan. Here I found a junk which was proceeding to Java, Sumatra, between which in this place there is a distance of forty days. I proceeded, therefore, and after a voyage of fifty days came to the countries of the Barak Nakar, a people who have mouths like those of dogs. This is a vile race, they have no religion, neither that of the Hindus nor any other. 
They live in houses made of reeds upon the seashore. Their trees are those of the banana, the falfel, and the beetle nut. Their men are of the same form with ourselves, except that their mouths are like those of dogs, but the women have mouths like other folks. The men go naked without the least covering whatever. Only one among them I saw who had put his virilia into a painted hollow reed which was hung to his belly. The women cover themselves with the leaves of trees. One who had had much intercourse with them told me that they copulate like beasts without the least concealment. The men will have thirty or more wives, but adultery is not committed. Should any one, however, be convicted of this crime, his punishment is to be hanged till he is dead, unless he brings either a friend or slave who is willing to be hanged for him. He may then go free. The sentence for the woman is that the king shall command all his servants to trample upon her one after another till she dies. She is then thrown into the sea. The women resist the men to a degree beyond their nature. But the men, from their baseness of character and fear about the women, will not allow any one of the merchants to proceed on the sea in front of their houses. They will merely consult and trade with them, carrying them fresh water on the backs of elephants. When we put into their ports, their king came to us riding upon an elephant, upon which there was something like a saddle-cloth made of skin. The king himself was dressed in goat-skin, the hairy part of which he had turned outwards. Upon his head was a turban of colored silk, and in his hand a short silver spear. With him was a number of his relations riding upon elephants, and using a language which no one could understand, unless he had been some time among them. We sent him the usual present, for every ship putting into any port of India is expected to send a present to the magistrate of the place. Now these people buy and receive his presents, she-elephants, over which they put their saddle-cloths, but do not completely clothe them. But any ship not giving them their present, they will so work upon with their magic that the sea will rise upon it, and it will perish, or they will return upon and injure it. End of section 10. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 11 of the Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 22. Arrival at Sumatra. Fruits. Currency. City of Sumatra. Introduction to the King, Royal Bounty, Religion, Sufi Sect of Mohammedans, Provisions for a Voyage to China, Arrival at Java, Natural Productions, Camphor, Cloves, Aloes, Frankincense, Superstitious Custom for the Production of Good Camphor, Description of Nutmeg, Mace, Arrival at Kukula, Customs in Java, Voyage in the Pacific, Arrival at the country of Tavalisi, Warlike character of its inhabitants and of the women in particular, Keluka, reigning queen, apparently of Turkish extraction, Regiment of women. We then left this place, and in fifteen days arrived at the island of Java, the place from whence the incense of Java receives its name. This is a green and blooming island. The greater part of its trees are the cocoa, the fawful, and the beetle nut, cloves, the Indian aloe, the shaki, the baransaki, barky, grapes, the sweet orange, and the camphor reed. The inhabitants traffic with pieces of tin and gold not melted, but in the ore, as coin. They have not many rich perfumes. More of these are to be found in the countries of the infidels, Hindus, perhaps nor are there many in the Mohammedan countries. When we had arrived at the shores of this place, we put into the port, which is a small village, in which there are some houses, as well as magazines for the merchants. And from this the city of Sumatra is at the distance of four miles. At that place resides the king. When we had got into port, the magistrate of the place wrote to the king, informing him of my arrival who sent one of his nobles and the judge who attended the presence to meet me. 
with him was sent one of the king's own saddle horses for myself and other horses for my companions i mounted therefore and set out for sumatra the king at that time was el malik el zahir jamal adin one of the most eminent and generous of princes of the sect of shafia and a lover of the professors of mohammedan law the learned are admitted to his society and hold free converse with him while he proposes questions for their discussion he is a great hero for the faith and so humble that he walks to his prayers on the friday he is too strong for his infidel neighbors they therefore pay tribute to him the inhabitants of his districts are of the sect of shafia and they attend him willingly on his warlike expeditions when i came to his residence his viceroy met me in an obliging manner bringing with him dresses of honour which he put upon me and upon my companions they then brought us victuals with the falfel nut and beetle leaf after this i returned to the lodgings which they had prepared for me in a garden and had completely furnished with couches and every necessary utensil morning and evening they brought us the tamarisk and other fruits from the vizier on the third day which was the friday they told me that the king was coming to the mosque and that my first interview with him would be there i accordingly went thither and at last the sultan came i saluted him he then took me by the hand and asked me of the king of india and of my travels and i answered him accordingly after prayers he sat and discussed religious questions with the professors of divinity being dressed as they were until the evening this is his and their usual practice nor does he ever come to the mosque except in the garb of a professor of divinity when the evening is past he enters a vestry in the mosque and there changes his robes for those of royalty with an upper garment of richly embroidered silk he then rides to his residence i remained partaking of his hospitality for fifteen days and then requested permission to pursue my journey to china a thing which he is not always prepared to grant he gave me permission however and fitted me out with provisions fruit and money may god reward him he also put me on board a junk bound for china i then proceeded for one and twenty days through his dominions after which we arrived at the city of muljava which is the first part of the territories of the infidels the extent of these territories is that of two months journey in these is found almost every sort of perfume they produce the aloe the kakuli and the kamari kakula and kamara being situated in these countries but in the territories of el malik el zahir and java there is only the frankincense of java camphor some cloves and indian aloes but we will now say what perfumes we ourselves witnessed in the territories both of the moslems and the infidels of this is the frankincense the tree of which is small and about the height of a man its branches are like those of the artichoke the leaves are small and thin and the incense is a gum which is formed in the branches more of this however is found in the territories of the mohammedans than in those of the infidels as to the camphor its tree is a reed like the reed of our own countries except only that it is thicker and the knots are longer the camphor is formed within it and when the reed is broken both camphor and myrrh are found within the knot and of the same form with it but the camphor will not form within the reed until some animal be sacrificed at the root the best camphor is exceedingly cooling and one dram of it will kill by bringing on suffocation this is called with them the cardena it is that at the roots of which a man has been sacrificed young elephants however are sometimes sacrificed instead of a man as to the indian aloe its tree resembles that of the oak except only that its bark is thin its leaves are like those of the oak but it has no fruit nor does the tree grow large its roots are long and extended and are scented within the leaves and trunk however have no perfume within them among the moslems this tree is considered property but among the infidels the greatest part of it is not so considered that which is private property is found at kakula and is the best sort this they sell to the inhabitants of java for clothing of the kamari species some is soft enough to receive an impression like wax with regard to the atas when one cuts off any of its roots and buries it in the earth for some months 
none of its strength will be lost. This is the most wonderful property of it. As to the clove, it is a thick and high tree. It is found in greater numbers in the countries of the infidels than of the Moslems. It is not claimed as property on account of its great abundance. That part of it which is taken into different countries is the Edan, wood. What is called the flowers of the clove in our countries is that which drops from its blossom, and is like the blossom of the orange. The fruit of the clove is the nutmeg, which is known by the scented nut. The bark which forms upon it is the mace. All that has here been related I saw with my own eyes. From this place we went on to the port of Kukula. It is a beautiful city surrounded with a stone wall of such a breadth that three elephants may walk abreast upon it. The first thing I saw upon its shores was the wood of the Indian aloe, placed upon the backs of elephants. This they lay up in their houses just as we do firewood, except that it is cheaper among them. The merchants will purchase a whole elephant load of it for one cotton dress, which is with these people more precious than silk. Elephants are in very great abundance here and are used for riding and burden. Each man ties his elephant to his door. The shopkeepers tie them to their shops, and in the evening they will ride out, purchase, and bring home anything they may want upon them. This is the custom of all the people of China and Kota. The king of Muljava is an infidel. I was introduced to him without his palace. He was then sitting on the bare ground, and his nobles were standing before him. His troops are presented before him on foot, no one in these parts having a horse except the king, for they ride on elephants generally. The king, on this occasion, called me to him, and I went. He then ordered a carpet to be spread for me to sit upon. I said to his interpreter, How can I sit upon a carpet while the sultan sits upon the ground? He answered, This is his custom, and he practices it for the sake of humility. But you are a guest, and besides you come from a great prince. It is therefore right that you should be distinguished. I then sat, and he asked me about the king Jamal Odin, to which I gave suitable replies. He then said, You are now my guest for three days. You may then return. I one day saw in the assembly of this prince a man with a knife in his hand which he placed upon his own neck. He then made a long speech, not a word of which I could understand. He then firmly grasped the knife, and its sharpness and the force with which he urged it were such that he severed his head from his body, and it fell on the ground. I was wondering much at the circumstance when the king said to me, Does any among you do such a thing as this? I answered, I never saw one do so. He smiled and said, These our servants do so out of their love for us. He then ordered the body to be taken up and burnt. He next went out in procession to the burning in front of his prime minister, the rest of his nobles, his army, and the peasantry, and on this occasion he made provision for the family and relations of the deceased, whose memory is greatly honored in consequence of this act. One who had been present at the assembly told me that the speech he made was a declaration of his love to the sultan and that on this account he had killed himself, just as his father had done for the father of the present king, and his grandfather for the king's grandfather. I then returned, but was sent for by the king to be his guest for the three days. After this I proceeded by sea, and after a voyage of four and thirty days came into the calm, that is, the still, sea. It has a red appearance which is thought to be occasioned by the lands near it. This sea has neither wind, wave, nor motion, notwithstanding its extent. It is on account of the calm state of this sea that three other vessels are attached to each of the Chinese junks, by which these junks, together with their own cargoes, are carried forward by oars. Of these there are twenty large ones which may be compared to the masts of ships. To each oar thirty men are appointed, and stand in two rows. By this means they draw the junks along, being connected by strong ropes like cables. This sea we passed in seven and thirty days, which we did with the greatest ease. We then came to the country of Tawalizi, which is thus named after its king, as is also his whole country. It is extensive, and the king will oppose the emperor of China. He possesses a great number of junks, and with these he will fight the Chinese until they offer conditions of peace. 
The people are all idolaters, handsome in appearance and resembling the Turks. They are much inclined to a copper color. They have great bravery and strength. Their women ride on horseback. They excel in throwing the javelin and will fight like men in battle. We put into one of their ports, which is near Keluka, one of their largest and most beautiful cities. The magistrate of this place is a daughter of the king, Wahi Arduya. She sent for the persons who were in the ship and entertained them, and when she was informed of my being there, she also sent for me. I went to her and saw her upon the throne of government. Before her were her women with papers in their hands on the affairs of state which they presented to her. She saluted and welcomed me in Turkish. Then she called for ink and paper in my presence and wrote with her own hand the bismillah, 